thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I will get things started here. Um, yeah, and today we'll be learning from Brent Messer, the former CIO and best-selling author. Um, it's, he'll be talking about the amazing success story of the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, to start with some basics, this will be an hour-long webinar and a recording will be sent out afterwards to all registrants. Um, additionally, we will have time at the end for questions um, during our Q&A session. You can use the Q&A functionality at the bottom of the screen to send in those questions as we go along um, and we'll visit them at the end. To start things off, I want to briefly share who Ideascale is and what we do. We empower organizations to harness crowdsourcing and drive innovation. We are government industry leaders and one of the few FedRAMP certified innovation management platforms. We were established in 2009 actually as a White House initiative and we've been helping organizations transform their cultures for almost 15 years. We host these webinars as a space for innovators to connect, share best practices and learn from each other as we know the power of collective intelligence. And I'm thrilled to be joined here today by Brent. Brent is an award-winning thought leader recognized as one of the most influential CIOs in North America. His innovative work for the city of Chattanooga led to its transformation into a tech powerhouse. On top of it all, Brent is a best-selling author with his book, Value Driven, the CIO's Handbook for Digital Transformation and Innovation in the Public Sector. He's going to be sharing with us today. Um, it can be found in greater detail in his book. So I'm going to send those links in the chat if anyone would like to delve into it further. And with that, I will pass things along to Brent. Great. Let's get it here. All right. Can everybody see that? Good. All right. Well, thanks, Lizzie. And thanks, everybody, for joining me uh, in today's webinar. I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey through history through one of the smartest cities in the world. I will touch on what it takes to innovate in government, something that is sometimes thought of as an oxymoron. I will discuss the foundation of the innovation process and then relate that to a few anecdotal examples of some challenges that I faced and what I did to overcome those challenges as the CIO of Gig City. First, since we're starting our journey down the rabbit hole that is government innovation, I want to address a concept and it's the term smart city. So what is a smart city exactly? Was ancient Rome a smart city? In fact, yes, it was. That's why I and most of my colleagues don't particularly like the term smart city, because it sort of implies that the smart city was once a dumb city, but that's not really the case. The Romans deployed the best technology they had to make Rome a thriving community, at least thriving according to the zeitgeist of the day. This is the same throughout history, but to, by today's standards, the definition is part of a greater digital transformation. A smart city is a place where traditional networks and services are made more efficient with the use of digital solutions for the benefit of its inhabitants and businesses. A smart city goes beyond the use of digital technologies for better resource use, less emissions, and it means smarter urban transportation networks, upgraded water supplies, waste disposal facilities, and of course, more efficient ways to light and heat buildings. But it means more than that. It means interactive and responsive city administration, public spaces that are safer, meeting the needs of an aging population, and a topic I'm known for vigorously supporting, removing digital poverty in the community, or is it sometimes called bridging the digital divide? This is where digital transformation and innovation come into this story. And speaking of transformations, let me take you back in time a bit to the very beginning of our story, which is farther back than you might think, back to March of 1969. In March of 1969, Walter Cronkite read EPA written report on CBS Evening News that named Chattanooga, Tennessee as the dirtiest city in the United States. Chattanooga went from being known for the Chattanooga Choo Choo of Glenn Miller fame in the 1940s to a city even dirtier than Los Angeles was at the time, LA still being a city known for some smog and poor air quality, though it's gotten a lot better. You can tell, uh, I can't even imagine what that must have looked like over the, the city to get that kind of a ranking. Contaminated waterways, higher health care costs due to poor air quality, and then to have the lowest life expectancy in the nation, too. It was a pretty bad report, and Chattanoogans were not happy with it, I can tell you that. Not long after that report was issued, the city went to work cleaning up its act, and by 1995, it was one of the cleanest cities in the United States. That alone is something to celebrate, a significant feat in its own right, but we Chattanoogans didn't stop there. Nope, we kept going. We revamped our downtown to make it more attractive to businesses and residents alike. We built the largest freshwater aquarium in the world at the time that it opened. That title now goes to one in Singapore. 
We were the first city in the world to establish a free electric shuttle bus service. Shuttles moved passengers around the downtown area and across the Tennessee River to our vibrant North Shore. We became known for our outdoors and related activities. Multiple times we have been named one of the best places to live in the nation. We made history again for creating the world's first and largest electric smart grid. Now, most people don't know this, but our fiber network, which by the way contains over 9,000 linear miles of fiber optic cable, over a 600 square mile area and growing, was actually not put in to become an internet service provider. It was for our smart grid. In simplest terms, our smart grid is a matrix of power and fiber lines. Smart meters are connected to the grid and monitored remotely. So gone are the days when a service truck pulls up to read the meter on your home or business to know how much power you are using. Now it's all done electronically. That's cool, but it does get even cooler. When a storm hits or a tree falls and power lines are cut, let's say transformer blows out, which is actually pretty common, in most communities that could knock out power for miles and in large parts of the community for hours, days, even at a time. I'm looking at you, Hurricane Ivan, having grown up in Florida and been without power for two weeks. With our smart grid technology, power is easily rerouted instantly where it can become um, limit the outage to a very small area. In the IT world, we call that eliminating single points of failure. It's kind of neat, really. And many times during heavy thunderstorms, we get a lot in this area in the south. It isn't uncommon for power to flicker or to even go out, but we start counting and most times within a few seconds, the power is on. Well, anyway, we put the smart grid in and now we have all this nice dark fiber and now it's only occasionally pinging smart meters. So we decide to make history again by becoming our own ISP and offering citizens what was at the time the fastest available internet you could get anywhere, one gigabit per second. Thus, we became the gig city. And even though we did ruffle a few feathers making that leap, including fighting a lawsuit, which we won, by the way, we continued up to ante. We soon offered 2.5 gigabits. A few years later, we upped that again to 10 gigabits per second. In 2022, we made history yet again when we announced 25 gigabits to every home and business in our service area. Once again, the world's fastest internet. Oh, and did I mention you can get a gig for just $67 a month? And that's a full gig, full gig down, full gig up. Our smart grid technology also helped us bridge the digital divide by offering free or low cost internet service to underserved areas. We also offered free classes on technology to help further close the gap by teaching parents and grandparents basic computer skills they needed to apply for jobs or help, other, help their kids with schoolwork that was now digital. And the pandemic has demonstrated to us that that is something that is absolutely critical for infrastructure right now. Our intelligent traffic system, part of our intelligent corridor and innovation district, is one of the most advanced in the nation and was developed through a partnership between the city, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga Center for Urban Informatics and Progress, and Oak Ridge Laboratories. And of course, we led the way in the U.S. by helping to create policy and definition around IoT, that's Internet of Things, and smart cities initiatives as part of the G20 Smart Cities Alliance. So, okay, we know that Chattanooga has done some amazing things since the horrible report by Walter Cronkite in 1969. The list of our smart cities and IoT tech in the just the last decade is a long one and could literally be a presentation in and of itself. And I'll speak to our digital transformation later on when we get to the part where I came in. But what's the point? Why would a medium-sized city with a population of just under 200,000 even care about innovating to this scale? Well, first, let's define what innovation is. When we typically think about innovation, we think of the private sector and we think about driving business growth, displacing markets or creating new markets creating a competitive advantage that will stave off the competition and give us a bigger market share, better brand perception, and attracting and retaining new talent. So which of these six reasons to innovate do government agencies use? Well, governments don't really displace markets, they don't create widgets to sell, and they don't really drive revenue growth the same way a for-profit business would. In fact, the closest thing to generating revenue that a municipality does is issue bonds. For the most part, the only things on this list that public sector cares about is talent attraction and brand perception. And yes, you heard me correctly, I said brand perception, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But first, let's continue with defining what innovation in government actually means. Why have government innovators? For government, innovation means something altogether different than the private sector. It means becoming more efficient and utilizing the latest technology to create a better community for its citizens and visitors as well. Also, we officially defined government innovation as leveraging new and more efficient ways to utilize technology to create social, economic, and environmental impacts on the community. Being an innovative government agency and building a city up the way Chattanooga did is more than just doing cool things with taxpayers' money. It's about making the community better. As an example, all of the smart cities technology that Chattanooga has pioneered over the last decade has had more than a few significant positive impacts on the community. In fact, they've had a significant impact on the entire US economy. 
From 2010 to 20, or 2010 to 2020, Chattanooga's fiber network helped generate over 9,500 jobs, brought in companies from all over the world, including some very big players like Komatsu and Volkswagen. All of those innovative ideas and technologies lured an extra $244 million in business ventures into the Chattanooga area. Chattanooga has helped attract $110 million in research projects and saved businesses $260 million in improved power reliability, which anybody running a data center knows how important that is. And it is estimated that this has all contributed to nearly $2.7 billion to the U.S. economy over the last 10 years. Contrary to popular belief, governments do compete, and competition is good for those governments. Chattanooga is a great example, competing with cable and TV internet providers that would not spend required millions of dollars needed to bring high-speed internet to underserved markets. High-speed internet being a commodity that is essentially like electricity and water, running water these days. The competition that came with making gig internet available to all of its citizens, not just markets that could afford it, was good for the community. An example I will frequently tout in my quest to help completely bridge the digital divide in our country. But the competition goes beyond just that alone. Innovation in government, especially when referring to smart cities tech, is becoming an attractive way for government agencies to have a competitive advantage. And this is true at the state level and at the county level, but it's especially true at the municipal level. States compete with each other all the time. States brand themselves as tax haven for businesses to attract firms, for example. And the municipal level, the competition can get even more fierce. Cities compete to bring businesses in too. Volkswagen looked at several possible locations for its new North American headquarters and the plant in which they built the new Passat. They chose Chattanooga in 2011 and again chose to expand at Chattanooga to build the Atlas and later the ID4, all of which could have been in Mexico. Now, I'm a baseball fan, so fans of Atlanta Braves know exactly what I'm talking about. The Boston Braves, who had been the, in Boston since 1871 at that time, known as the Boston Red Stockings, moved to Milwaukee in 1954, only to relocate to Atlanta in 1966. This caused a lot of problems for Milwaukee and brought a lot of growth and prosperity to Atlanta. It also led to a lawsuit that made its way up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. This is where my comment earlier about brand perception comes into play. You see, when you're the gig city, it's much easier to attract new businesses to the region. Okay, so you're a CIO for a government agency that could be chief information, innovation officer, whatever. What do you do to start your innovation journey? I'll start this section off by asking a question. I won't be able to hear you answer. Uh, you can type it in if you'd like but I will pause for a minute to let you contemplate your answer and also for dramatic effect. The question is, what is one product that IT in any organization produces and sells? And yes, I did say sell, more on that later. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. One product and one product only. It's not servers, it's not email, it's not connectivity, it's none of that. It's value. And if we are not providing value, then we are not doing our jobs correctly. And remember, when I said the CIO sells this concept, a great CIO inside of a government agency needs to be a good salesperson. They must be able to sell their value proposition across the organization in order to be truly successful, especially when you are trying to explain the concept of innovation to government and the powers that be in the organization that may not understand or even care about technology in general, or say elected officials with their own agendas. This is normal things we have to deal with. I mean, in reality, that skill comes in handy even when you're not talking innovation, just like trying to get budgetary approval for two-factor authentication or something else that's just a routine foundational IT thing anybody should have. I want to touch back on the subject of branding, though. Branding innovation in IT inside of an organization is just as important as the government organization's efforts to brand externally. So where do we start? We start with changing your vernacular. First, how we label and define things is important. Take governance, for example. If you name a governing body something like IT Steering Committee or Advisory Committee, you subconsciously enable thinking that they're there to help run or guide IT, and that's not the purpose of IT governance. Using words like planning make better names for governance. Planning Committee, Technology Planning Committee, bodies that help you reinforce the concepts that I'm talking about here. Second, there is no such thing as an internal customer. I will repeat that. There is no such thing as an internal customer. Don't use that term and don't teach your staff to use it either or teach your staff not to use it either rather. There is only one customer for any government organization and that is the taxpayers who use government services. The other departments you and IT work with, whether they're police, fire, sheriff, clerk, supervisor of elections, HR, whatever, those are your partners. You are all partners in one organization working to collectively serve your customer, the citizens who are paying your salary. Besides, if you treat internal departments like customers, then they will treat you like a vendor. And we all know how that can be. 
you are not there to serve them in that regard. And if you act that way, they will demand things and it will make, make innovation extremely difficult. You must all be on the same page, all sitting at the planning table as equals. And finally, there, just like there's no such thing as an ongoing project, there's also no such thing as an IT project. Do not call your ERP or CAD system replacement or whatever it is an IT project. It does not, IT does not own any system in an organization except their ITSM. Everything else is owned by the organization and those departments respectfully. IT is just there to facilitate, to support, and make things happen in the background. Yes, you can run the project, but the organization needs to be involved and they need to take ownership. You are branding everything as an IT project. You will find it very difficult to get the funding you need and the lack of understanding could cause problems. And if something goes wrong, guess who they're going to point the finger at? You got it, IT. If you are already like that, then it's time to start changing that in your organization and change that perception. Do that by changing your vernacular first and then changing their perception. You are not a vendor who serves. You are a trusted partner who collaborates and supports. Okay, so you know what your product is, value. You know the first things to change are the perception of IT and innovation. So where do you start to weave your way through the political charged bureaucracy and achieve this innovative state? The foundation for providing true long-term value, getting you to a state of innovation, are the four pillars of excellence in technology. These will help you tell and sell your value proposition. Operational excellence. You must strive to be the most efficient and effective you can be. You must constantly look to improve in every way, become as lean as possible, have strong leadership, build a great culture and environment of trust and innovation, and that something that's attractive to the best IT talent. And then of course, hire, develop and retain solid performing IT. Yeah, Brent, that's so much easier to do. It's not, it's difficult, but it's important, very important. Standardization and reuse. You must implement tailored industry standards and best practices throughout and remain centralized as much as possible, including central acquisition of standardized technology, purchasing and governance. Very few examples of a federated model have I seen work, especially at a municipal level, it needs to be standardized and centralized. Sustainability, look to implement sustainable technologies wherever feasible, strive to utilize lean management practices and can constantly improve processes for peak performance and peak efficiency. Strive to provide a consistent and constantly improving user experience with a focus on excellent functionality of core systems and processes and being the provider of choice, again, for your partners. Technological maturity, plan and maintain your enterprise architecture appropriately using the correct methodology, the tools, and the organization's information of capital. A core goal should always be able to keep the technology architecture up to date. Core systems are interoperable. And this one especially ties in well with our concept of innovation. In order to innovate, you must maintain technological maturity. So with these in mind, the foundation for everything actually starts with you. The leader of IT or innovation, or in some cases, both. Solid leadership is the foundation of everything. When you want to innovate in government, you have to have it. Without it, you don't innovate. Once you've established yourself in a positive change agent, you've established a positive perception of your brand, you've established your value proposition as the norm, then you can start innovating. Solid leadership, change agent, partnering, selling your value, creating an environment, and then, of course, having a solid strategy and roadmap. Okay, with all of that said, let's go to the part of the digital transformation story where I came in. On February 3rd of 2014, my first day on the job, I went to meet the new mayor for the first time. And in that 30 minute meeting, the network went down twice. Three minutes into the meeting, the mayor's admin yells out, the network is down again. The look on the mayor's face changed to a slight frown. 10 minutes later, network is back. And then about five minutes after that, network is down again. Mayor looked at me and said, I am this close to outsourcing the whole thing. Please fix this mess. As we were walking out of the mayor's office, the COO or chief operating officer, who was my boss, jokingly handed me a folded piece of paper. And as he did, he said, here, Messer, he called me Messer because his name was Brent too. Here, Messer, this is our IT. Can you polish it up for me? I opened the paper and it was this happy little guy. He was joking with me, of course, but we both later found out the irony of how right he actually was. The city may have cleaned up its air pollution, cleaned up its waterways and rejuvenated its downtown, but along the way, it forgot to update the critical infrastructure behind the scenes that was running the city's systems. In a matter of speaking, the city was still dirty behind the scenes. I kept picturing Walter Cronkite and I could hear his voice, iconic voice in my head saying, see, I told you so. The extent of how bad it actually was kept me up at night. And when I did sleep, I was dreaming about or rather having nightmares about being hacked, ransomware or lack of funding needed to spend it and get it all fixed up. 
Let's just say a month later, I brought that paper back and told the CIO, COO how right he actually was and that I should have asked for more money. Anyway, backing up a bit. Not long after that first iconic meeting in the mayor's office, I sent out a diagnostic survey to the entire city looking to find out exactly what the value, if any, IT had been bringing to the city and what the city thought of IT's contribution and services. The result wasn't good at all. The original diagnostic came back with a satisfaction rating of only 53%, and the comments I got were extremely harsh. Basically, all the city hated the IT department. It was a very good feedback, though. In fact, it gave me the baseline from which to start. The only bright side here was there was only one way to go from there, and that was up. Being the statistician and data geek that I am, I also did some nerdy calculations on our total network availability. I was shocked that the total availability was just 89%. 89.237 to be exact. Let me put that in simpler terms real quick. You've all seen ads for data centers and services and products and things like that. They claim 99% uptime, right? Have you ever actually stopped to think about what that really means? 89.24% equates to shutting down your network access to your systems and your network for two hours and 35 minutes a day. That's 18 hours a week or three days, five hours a month. Annually, it's about 40 days. So can you imagine the look you would get as a CIO if you walked into your boss's office and said, we have to shut the city's network down for 40 days, so see you in a little over a month. No, that's ridiculous. Not, not, not going to happen. Even just 99% uptime is still 14 minutes a day, or equivalent to shutting things down for about four days a year. So 99.99, what we usually strive for, still equates to about eight seconds a day, but that's, that's acceptable. We were measuring our system availability and performance to the thousandth place on a daily basis because, yes, it was that important. And I wanted to track everything we could to plan an effective transformation. And if you don't know where you currently are and where you currently stand, you can't know whether you've achieved where you want to be. 89.237 was really bad, and rightly so, considering that the average age of technology throughout the city, from the newest device to the oldest, at least the oldest I could find, was about 15 years old. That's the average age, mind you. We had a mashup of desktops, laptops, running everything from Windows 7 back to XP. We even found one machine still in production and being used that was running Windows 98 second edition. And I kid you not, it was running some required software that hadn't been updated in about 16 years and was still needed to be able to use that software. Most were more than five years old. Some machines staff were using were 10 or more years old and slower than dirt. The laptop I was handed on day one was a gigantic brick Dell running Windows XP. It was easily 10 years old. Our tax system was so old, I'm talking from the early 80s, that we were ordering parts off eBay to keep in stock just in case we needed them. One person in the department told me that we were afraid to reboot it for fear it wouldn't come back up. I'm not sure if that was exaggeration or not, but either way, it was scary and not good. We found network switches haphazardly hanging off of small racks mounted backwards over toilets and firehouses. We found network switches mounted close to showers. Hey, there's a brilliant idea. In one instance, my staff, uh, took me into a room, climbed up a ladder, moved a ceiling tile, and lifted the tile and, and said, go up there and take a look. I was amazed to see an old token ring air switch not connected to anything on the network, but still plugged in and blinking away. Again, this is my first time as a CIO, so I emphasize I did not sleep very well that first year. Moving on to our data center. Our data center was an entire building with two stories, two long bays of racks with servers ranging from three years old to about 23 years old are huge bricks of machines, I forget the name of them, what they were called at the time, sitting on the floor with a tiny little 12-inch green screen monitor and an old clackety keyboard, one that didn't even have a Windows key. That was the system that ran our tax software. <clears throat> there were two big AC units in the back of the room pumping cold air into the room, but it was still hot. No raised floor, so cables were strewn all over the place, mostly in a tangled mess. I was assured that the network team knew what every wire was because they had labels on them. I still found wires with no labels on them, and I asked about those. I was told those are old and not in use anymore. What? So why are they still here? Along one wall was a stack of backup tapes, the whole wall next to a bathroom. And one guy came in every day for 40 years and took those backup tapes, and that's all he did all day for 40 years. There were walls, water stains on the floor and the ceiling. There was a wall far side of one of the rows with our VLAN and DMARC and everything on it. It had huge cracks in the brick, huge, stuffed with things. I asked what the deal was with the cracks. I was told the building attached to the building next door had collapsed due to disrepair a few years ago. Walking out of the data center, my face was white as a sheet. I pointed to the diesel generator just outside the data center and behind the fence, and I asked, when was the last time we tested it? All I got was a shrug. 
I felt sick to my stomach. When I asked to see the disaster recovery and the continuing operations plan, the guy I was with wasn't sure there was one, so he contacted the deputy CIO at the time to email them to me. I got no email. There were no plans. A little while later, I did get an email from one of the staff who was with us who had overheard the conversation, and it contained a meme of Kermit the Frog waving his arms in the air, running around like crazy, yelling, ah, with the caption, RDR coop plan. At that point, I was extremely worried. I uh, I continued my assessment. We found countless phone lines in the city that the city was paying for every month that didn't even have phones connected and in some cases were not even active. We found duplicate systems with few users actually using those systems that were costing taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in licensing. My staff and I literally went through every phone line, every piece of software, every piece of hardware and found boatloads of waste everywhere. There was still a huge, fully operational microfish filming machine thing. I'd never seen one until that point. Typewriters still on desks and they were being used. We systematically went through every inch of the city and all buildings and all systems to get the true picture. And yes, I was involved in that process from the very beginning, at least why I evaluated the staff that I inherited. And that picture was not pretty by any means. That process took about five months to complete and we did it from eight in the morning until sometimes 11 at night. There were several weeks I left for work at 7 a.m. and didn't get home till past midnight. I got to know the cleaning and maintenance staff very well, which was good. They were nice people and they helped out. During my assessment, I asked to see a diagram of our network topology and security policy, maybe an acceptable use policy. All I got was blank looks. Okay, I thought, I, I need to know what I'm dealing with here talent-wise. So I sent out an IT staffing assessment diagnostic to get an idea of how they spent their time, team dynamics, what they thought of their efficiency, processes, capabilities, things like that. The result of that assessment diagnostic combined with my observations and the conversations that I had had with staff over the previous four or five months I knew I had some decent talent that wasn't being fully utilized. In fact, some of them were one foot out the door, ready to look for other jobs. I had to act quick. Some were, like we all face, retired in place. Some were, well, less than idea for their roles. The senior management was definitely needed some retraining for sure. And let me emphasize this real quick when we talk about innovation. Micromanagement is one huge innovation killer. Studies show that most people don't leave jobs because of the organization as a whole, they leave jobs because of poor managers and a lack of leadership. I knew I had to start there and make changes in the organizational structure pretty quick. The current reporting structure to the department made no sense at all. I had three people dedicated to doing nothing but keeping two old Exchange servers running and running two very old editions of Exchange that pretty much crashed twice a day. Waste was everywhere. So time to roll up my sleeves and get started on this thing. I got to work quick, really turned the department upside down, literally. The absolute worst part of leadership, of course, is having to deal with disciplinary actions and even worse, having to let people go, but it's a critical part of the job. I did have to let some senior management go. Others that I thought I had a chance to recover and attempt to retrain and repurpose, gave them some mentoring, some training. Still, after a few attempts to train some of them, I still had to demote them back to where their expertise was. They didn't do anything wrong per se. It was just the Peter principle, promoted, promoted beyond their capability and not giving any training or mentoring. That was not a failure on their part. That was a failure on the previous leadership. Some of them left of their own accord. Others got with the program, ended up being great employees. After I created some new senior director positions and filled those, some from within, I completely restructured the entire department, not once, but twice in that first year. Then I took my assessment findings. I gathered my new senior division directors. We determined what our desired state was gonna be. We performed several gap analysis and we put all that down in a formal written strategic plan. One version we kept internal to the city as it contained details about aging infrastructure and things I didn't want leaked to the outside world because the last thing I wanted to do was paint an even bigger target on us and invite more attempts to get through our inferior security measures, which in some places were non-existent. The public version was so that we could show the plan not only with the citizens of Chattanooga, but also vendors who may potentially see the plan and come offering assistance because we needed it badly. This plan was short and to the point, and basically this is what we are planning and here's why. Then I got to work on Lean Six Sigma concept of eight wastes. We all got down to the business of making Chattanooga better. First, we started by fixing our deteriorating network infrastructure, beefing up security and removing unwanted waste. I started putting the good talent to use and empowering staff to take charge of their areas of expertise, to own their work and to take pride and responsibility in it. They had direction, my vision for the future, our mission to accomplish, they were all fired up. Though there were still a few folks who were not at all thrilled about being held accountable, morale did go up quite rapidly. So much so that in fact, some of those that were not on board were being held accountable by those that were on board. As a single unit, we went through every aspect of our infrastructure. We wrote and issued security policies, acceptable use policies, which in some cases were quite liberal. 
We went through inventory, which if you know anything about me, the just-in-time method is what we like to use and teach regarding. Uh, speaking of which, one dis disappointing discovery, we found over 50 network switches that had been bought, basically shelved, and been there for over two years. But two years into the warranty, that they have not been unboxed or installed. What in the world? I asked what was going on. They said they got a good deal if they bought in bulk. So instead of $8,000 a piece, which is about 10,000 K today, you got a deal and only paid 7,300 a piece. That's about $9,500 today. So the rationale was essentially save the cost of 3.4 switches by buying 50 at once. So you save $35,000, but you let them sit on the shelves, which uh, actually costed you about 175 K or more. That was the logic. So looking at all our current processes, we scrutinized every single one. We drew up diagrams, flow charts, we were on a roll. But through the eight ways, every area of the department we could find and document it at all. And while we were doing it, we calculated the cost savings and tracked every last bit of it over time. By October of 2014, we had increased availability from 89.24% to 91.36%. Not perfect, but it was a great feat. We weren't finished yet. By November of 2016, we had achieved a solid foundation in which to innovate. Our availability was 99.98%. Our entire goals and our strategic plan had not only been achieved, but exceeded and ahead of schedule. We had documented the savings of over 1.8 million taxpayer dollars per year. Not one-time savings, mind you. That's each and every year going forward. We were saving that much money. And that was only in IT. Remember the day one of my members of my staff came into my office and after a staff meeting where we were celebrating the wind, and he said, boss, we've done the supposedly impossible, so now what? I looked at him and said the most cliche thing I could possibly think of, which is now we really get to work. Both laughing at the cliche statement, but it was undoubtedly true. We had only built the foundation. Now came the fun part. Now we could start the digital transformation of the entire city and start innovating. In all seriousness, that was the day that I issued the Chattanooga IT motto of Semper Novande, which roughly translates into always innovating. Now our systems were automated, mostly cloud-based. Our data center was moved, not to another data center, but to the cloud. Um, the, thing, the only thing we had on-prem was a single rack of blades, all virtualized, and that was now in our ultra-secure EPB data center, which used to be our colo. We sold the building that used to be the data center, and we used the funding for better things. Our collab and backup systems were now in the cloud and AWS and GCP. There were no desktop computers anywhere in the city. Every person in the city had a new laptop, monitors, and docking stations. It was now a fully mobile city, which I will add that in March of 2020 came in extremely handy. We had everybody working from home within 24 hours. We had a BYOD policy, stipends for those that use the personal phones for work. We could control all access to any system in the city, and if a phone or device was lost, we could instantly remove it from any critical infrastructure or access. We had robust security measures in place. We monitored the network 27, 24 seven. We were platform agnostic, which means we could issue any device we wanted. Most of IT used MacBooks. Myself, I still do. Most of the mayor's office had MacBooks. Uh, most of the department heads got MacBooks. A few IT staff opted for Linux machines. Everyone else in the city was issued semi-rugged PC laptops or Chromebooks. We could be totally cloud-based, so it didn't matter what device we were using, and we had no need for a VPN anymore either. We had finally reached the point of Nirvana, and with all this in place, and a lot more I didn't mention, I decided to shake things up again, and I turned the entire IT department upside down. I completely reorganized it from top to bottom again. And you might ask, why on earth would you take progress and do something like that? The answer is because it wasn't perfect and we could still improve and still get to a better state of innovation. And I'd still had some folks stubbornly coming along for the ride that weren't really participating, killing the morale and the innovation vibe. So more change was needed. So what did I do? I went agile, or as we like to put it in Chattanooga, chagile. Now, I can mentally see the looks on your faces and hear the confusion. Wait, that's it? That's all you did was go Agile? Man, we went Agile too, so what? Well, let me explain. Here's the thing about Agile. It's not just a framework you unpack, read, and apply. You, you don't do Agile, you become Agile. Yeah, it's a method, blah, blah, blah. I'm certified and I teach all this stuff to organizations all over the place, but that wasn't the point. It's a mindset. More importantly for me at that time, it was an entire paradigm shift, which is exactly what I needed. So what I did was I paid to bring an expert in Scrum to teach and certify my entire department in Scrum methodology, including myself. I also included a few select folks from other departments in the city, from HR, finance, and the mayor's office. I included them so that they could see firsthand what the transformation was that we were going through. It would help me later you know, explain to them what my strategy was so that they would understand it. And also when I went to go looking for money, 
I didn't expect them to entirely get the IT part of it. In fact, I expected them to not get that part and ensured them that I just wanted them to observe, participate as best they could or if they wanted to, and mostly just wanted them to see the process for themselves. And while it seemed crazy at the time, this layer paid off with great dividends. And I know you're still scratching your head as to how this was shaking up the department. Okay, long story short. After everyone went through two days of on-site agile scrum training, the instructor had everyone take a pretest. And at the end of that pretest, he told me who he thought was good enough to actually sit for the Scrum Master certification exam, which we also paid for. I gave everyone the option of being certified. The ones he said would be good enough sure were. In fact, they passed with flying colors, including some who were very low on the proverbial totem pole and one who wasn't even in IT, which was amazing. Once the exam results came back and I had my certified Scrum Masters, that's when I really went all wonder works on them. Here's where things get a little wonky. Two weeks after the certification exam, I procured a large city space big enough to fit my entire department with plenty of room to move around. I brought the entire department in, let them sit where they want, and when everybody was settled, had a chance to grab breakfast burrito and some coffee or tea or whatever, I said, everyone stand up. Here's what we're doing. On the screen, I flipped to our org chart and I said, you see this? It's null and void. All I got was looks of confusion and some raised hands. What do you mean null and void? I said, well, I'm glad you asked. I mean, this entire department is now free of managers, directors, and supervisors, et cetera. I said, I'm responsible for the department, everyone in it, but you are now in charge of yourselves. I waited a tick to see if this sank in and got some really strange looks. I reiterated, do you remember the Scrum Master training? I got a collective yes. And what was the most important thing about Scrum teams? My star pupil and resident class clown piped up in his signature Tennessee draw, they're self-managing. Bingo, I said. Then I asked who wanted to be a scrum master, and I specified they had to have passed the certification exam. Well, I only had nine people outside of the entire senior leadership staff, which included me, my deputy, and four directors at the time who had passed the exam. Five people raised their hand. I took those five, brought them up to the front, and I said, here are your instructions. There are 40 staff in this room, not including me and the directors. I had other plans for them. They were my team, which I got to explain to the staff so that they knew that we were part of this process. But before I let them loose, I gave them some criteria. I said, you can pick anyone you want to be on your scrum team. But the rule was you had to have at least one service desk tech, one developer, one network engineer, and one business analyst. The rest was up to you. Manager, supervisor, those were off the table. They were now just like everyone else falling back on their specialties. I told them to pick their teams, find their spot in the room, and gather around the whiteboard. We had five rolling whiteboards that we provided. Suddenly, there was a scramble to pick team members. Once the teams assembled and started forming, two camps started to form, as was expected. The team players, those who immediately jumped on board and started the team building process of forming, storming, and norming, and contributing, and then non-team players, those that procrastinated or outright refused to participate, including some of our usual complainers we already assumed were going to be in this category. And while it wasn't yet apparent right away, I was expecting to see a few champions, a few natural born leaders who filter up from the bottom and start to lead. After they had chosen their team names, I gave them all assignments and told them that each team had a few specific assignments to achieve and that all teams were responsible for service desk support. I told them that the scrum master was not a manager and was intended as just a guide, a facilitator who worked for the team as a whole. That was their job. Someone who would help break barriers and champion the team's efforts. The team itself was self-managed and completely responsible for each other's actions or non-actions as a whole. About a week into this restructuring, I was standing in the hallway of the top floor of our building with my deputy and a couple of directors discussing upcoming police initiative. And we were trying to figure out, okay, we, we made this mess. Now, how do we assign this and how are we going to do it with all this new self-managing structure? Anyway, one of the scrum masters comes up to it. He looks me right in the face. I was prepared for the worst. So... Choosing team members, he said. I have two team members who aren't exactly participating as they should. The rest of the team is getting quite agitated with them, and we've tried everything we can, and they still refuse to do any work at all. Okay, I said, what would you like to do about it? He continued, can I swap them for two different team members? Inside my head, I was not only chuckling to myself, but my mind was turning. I looked at my deputy who had a look on her face, and we both had not thought of this ever happening. We assumed the teams, once they chose it, were made that way. But I turned to him and I quickly said, hey, look, it's your team. If they are OK with it and you can find two replacements and everybody else in the department is OK with it, go for it. Here's the brilliant part. Not only did the Scrum Master rally his team, Team CRUD, for create, read, update, delete. It's a programming thing. Anyway, they figured out a plan to replace the two duds on their team using the two duds own bias against them to make it happen, too. They told the two non-compliant team members that if they could go 
find their friends or whoever in the department they wanted to work with because that was what the major issue was. They wanted to go with their cliques and convince two other members or more in those teams to reconfigure in a way that would get two members on the team crud, that team crud didn't care how the rest of the race uh, was organized. It was a brilliant move and one I only paid very close attention to, but I actually admired. And it worked too. A few days later, Team Crud was not only getting their work done, but crushing everything else they could get their hands on. This guy had taken a mismatched, broken team and figured out a way to reconfigure it to be successful. He used all their strengths and balanced everyone's weaknesses to create the perfect team. This guy was a rock star, and the entire team he created were rock stars too. They were going places, and I was going to make sure I got out of their way so that they could. This guy, by the way, was in fact the lowest paid person in all of IT. He was a new hire who was only there just barely a year, who embraced the idea of Agile and Scrum from the get-go and just crushed it. This person was hired as a telecommunications technician. All he needed was for us to get out of his way and give him an opportunity to thrive, and boy, did he ever thrive. This person, who today is not only a good friend of mine, he's a trusted colleague, but someone whose feedback and input I greatly respect. <clears throat> As a result of this departmental upheaval, he was promoted within my department and given a great deal more responsibility, which again, he crushed, sadly for us. A few years later, he moved on, but not due to his, but only due to his ambition for the betterment of himself and his family. He's now making good money, managing a large development team and agile scrum in a very large corporation and very happy doing it and still crushing it, I might add. I had quite a few folks in the department to do that over the years. In fact, several others come to mind who were hired in lower positions and just crushed it when given the opportunity to do so. They trained, they strove for more, and most importantly, they were empowered. They were empowered not just to own their own area, but to go beyond that. About two months into our Chagile experience, I had someone come up to me and say, this whole scrum thing is effing dumb, and turned in their resignation. 12 people total all the retired in place, non-compliant folks who refused to work with the team, complained the whole time, didn't contribute, hated being held accountable, didn't offer any other methods or suggestions or hated the whole experience entirely, quietly moved on to other jobs or in the city or elsewhere. Except for the one who effing hated his dumb scrum thing, they left with vigor, which I get and I can respect that. I also had several people retire as well. All of this turnover was anticipated and welcomed. This left opportunity for those who remained and those that did remain showed their team spirit and just crushed anything that was tossed their way. It's a sad fact, but sometimes you have to clean house in order to get things moving in the right direction. Taken from nature, you might say, the forest burns, yet new life springs up after the chaos settles. And that's when I once again restructured the department. Back to a more traditional approach, still agile, but not chagile. And let's be honest, the whole chagile thing wasn't going to work anyway and not for very long. And I knew that. It wasn't the point of the exercise anyway. Two of the five teams rose to the top and proved themselves to be rock stars. I wish more of the teams had done that, but the truth is it wasn't entirely the team's fault. It was inevitable that some of those that refused to participate or be team players held back those that were being team players. Uh, we recognized, and trust me, the team players shined. In fact, some of them actually moved off of those teams into the two teams that were actually doing things because they recognized that there was value there. By the end of the first quarter of 2017, I had one of the most efficient and well-oiled IT departments you could possibly imagine. And that's when we really started to take off on the innovation playing field. Over the next six years, we digitally transformed everything we could get our hands on in the city. We established great partnerships with all of the departments who eventually always made sure IT was involved in every initiative from the very beginning. And trust me, that is not an easy thing to do. And it took some time to get that concept going. We built a solid PMO and established a solid governance model. Our department value numbers went through the roof and our satisfaction ratings exceeded 93%, which is fantastic. Trust me, you'll never reach 100. And if you do, either you have too small a sample or something else is going on. We again went at first fully agile development to full on DevOps, and we didn't get it right at first. We fell on our face plenty of times, but we didn't stop and we never gave up. We made mistakes and that's okay. And I tell my staff, failure is an option. Learn from it. Don't repeat it. And they did. And they kept getting better and better and better. I established a work from anywhere policy long before the pandemic. And it wasn't uncommon for me to walk around our innovation district and see my staff commingling with other people from firms all over the city, trading ideas, collaborating, and most importantly, innovating. We held monthly staff meetings with team building exercises. We had a robust awards program and several incentives to bring out the best in my staff and encourage innovation. We even took an annual IT retreat each year, which is something we did fun as a group, kayaking, disc golf. And last year I was there, we took everyone to Top Golf, which was really cool. 
We eventually went out and captured all of the shadow IT personnel across the city and built a single centralized IT department that ran everything technology across the city, including traffic signals. And we were innovating out the wazoo. Our partnerships with EPB, the T University of Tennessee Center for Urban Informatics and Progress, Oak Ridge Labs, the Enterprise Center, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Volkswagen, and other cities across the US and abroad led to countless smart cities initiatives and award-winning programs. We even had the Tennessee State Senate enact changes in law to support some of our efforts. We literally became the poster child for innovation in government and an incubator for talent. I even had people from other departments in the city wanted to come work with us because of what we had built and the environment in which we worked. So I actually hired a former firefighter to come be a developer. We hired a former police officer to be a business analyst. We saved everything we could too. In addition to that $1.8 million we saved taxpayers those first two years, by the time I left the city in 2022, we had saved taxpayers over $4.9 million a year. And again, that's per year, every year going forward, not just once. The environment I created for my staff empowered them to innovate successfully and with as few barriers as possible. I always say that as a CIO, it's actually my job to work for them, to knock down barriers, seek funding, establish relationships, pave the path forward, and get the hell out of their way and let them shine. I had one of my staff come to me sad with a job offer that offered better pay, but they didn't want to leave, not just because of the impact they were having on the city, but because they loved their role and the impact. They understood what their contribution was, and they were proud of it. They respected our mission, understood it, bought into the vision I had set, and were champions of that vision all over the city. They loved the staff they worked with. They were companions. They had become change agents and innovators in their own right. And I'm proud of each and every one of those staff who went the extra mile, took the path less taken, found broken things on their own, and took the initiative to fix them as a team, as per our mission. And they were champions of the vision. As for Chattanooga's story, this is far from the end. We Chattanoogans are a tenacious bunch of innovators, and I can't wait to see what the city does next, but I can't wait to see what all the organizations that are coming into the city does, making the world and Chattanooga a better place. As for me, having helped build one of the smartest cities in the world, I couldn't have picked a better time to pass on the keys to Gig City to the next generation of government innovators. For the last two years, I've had the pleasure of working with CIOs and cities, counties, states all over the country, helping them to drive innovation and make their communities a better place for all not to mention my tenacious pursuit of bridging the digital divide and trying to eliminate digital inequity in our country. I would also like to add that I am but one person in this amazing transformation story. I had the backing and support of an amazing administration. I had the amazing staff championing and supporting these efforts the whole way, and in some ways leading me down that path. There are countless people who have been involved in this story, and I wish I had the time to name all of them. They all know who they are, and I thank each and every one of them for their tireless contributions to making Chattanooga one of the smartest and most innovative cities in the world. This is definitely a team effort, not an individual one. And I will leave you with this. I want you to remember, when we do in government isn't always glamorous. In fact, it rarely ever is, but it is nevertheless critical to the future of society and has a tremendous impact that can be either good or bad. It is up to us to decide which that is. Best of luck to all of you in your endeavors to innovate society's future and Semper Novandi. All right, thank you, Brent, for that great presentation. We'll now open up the Q&A. Um, you'll see the functionality at the bottom. It says Q&A, and you can submit your answers there, and I will field them to Brent. The first one I have is coming from William. He says, how might you build innovation into strategic planning of a municip sorry, municipal agency and create definable milestones without knowing what that innovation might actually be? Well, innovation in and of itself, as I said before, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? So you can you, you don't have to have an alignment. And um, I'll give you an example uh, for a clerk's office uh, that I worked with in Florida. The the clerks are the, their their mission. If you don't have an alignment with the mission, that's not such a big deal, right? You know what the government agency is there to do. They're there to make the society better. So any way that you can go around and figure out a way to innovate things is going to be beneficial to put in your plan. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We have a couple other ones. Um, I, I see one, the opinion of the criteria that it is or should be used to determine underserved. That's a very good question. Um, for what we looked at, um, it was basically those that could not afford or didn't have access to certain things. 
from a technology standpoint. And it, well, it goes beyond just connectivity and digital co connectivity. Um, it was those that didn't have the educational background or understanding of technology. And example is students were bringing laptops or Chromebooks home to do work on, right? And it was, this was evident during the pandemic, especially, but even before then. And the grandparents or parents who they didn't know how to help them with that kind of stuff. So that was part of the criteria for looking at ways that we could help that with training and exercises and, and teaching them um, free classes so that they could learn how to do that. The other part was the connectivity piece by putting Wi-Fi in certain neighborhoods or by providing low cost. Uh, so like instead of our gig, we would offer a um, 100 meg connection for like $19 a month through if, if anybody that was, say, on um school lunch or one of the state programs they could qualify for that so that was where the qualifications came from awesome makes sense we have a couple more in the chat one from david is relating to the, the kind of like workplace culture you were creating how many meetings are too many meetings should you have meetings on friday i had a no meetings on friday policy and i still have a no meetings on friday policy <laughs> Um, and we did that on purpose. The whole idea behind that was, yes, we only met when we had to. Um, from an Agile standpoint, we had the daily scrum and all those types of things. But communicating with the departments is extremely critical in having that partnership. So we were meeting with them a lot, uh, going over things with the PMO and talking, you know, mission. And I was with the police chief and all the, you know, all everybody meeting at the same time. But we minimized it as much as possible. I would meet with them once a quarter. Um, and the no Friday policy thing was unless it was absolutely necessary. That was so that people could finish up their work on Friday and not have to take anything home for the weekend. It was nice to be able to get everything out of the way, not have to worry about any of the meetings. You can do your casework. You can do everything you need to do on the project. And then you can slide on out of the weekend and not have to have those things on your mind. Awesome. All right. And Clay is wondering, how do you verify that you are delivering value? There's a couple of ways to do that. Um, one, I mentioned using diagnostics. Uh, you can measure that stuff over time. The KPIs that you have in place are extremely important. There's countless number of KPIs you can measure for that. Not just talking about uptime. I didn't go into detail for all of them, but that's the main way, way to determine whether you are adding value. And you can know that even with the conversations you're having. As soon as you have, you know, when IT becomes the go-to, like there was a times like everybody came like, okay, there's a project going on. Well, let's make sure Brent and his guys are in here before we start this, as opposed to what we started with, which was, hey, by the way, IT, uh, we built this building. Can you go in and put some wiring in it and connect our phones and stuff like that? <laughs> no, because you covered up the walls already. So those are ways to tell the value. But using diagnostics and using KPIs to be able to measure those, those things over time is a good way to determine that. Great. And we have one from Colin in the chat. Um, he's saying, you called out transformation to your agile approach. This is recognized as a best practice for digital transformation projects and validated by your success. But most all government agencies issue RFPs that are asked for a fixed price upfront. So what approach does Chattanooga take when issuing RFPs and does it align with the agile methodology of project execution? At that time, we did the best that we possibly could to be able to align that. It is not easy for everyone to do that. Um, fixed pricing is something that just happens in government, and that, that process is just something you can use. But actually running the project, once you've gone through the RFP process and you've gone through your selection, you've picked it, we didn't have any problems running most of our projects as Agile. In fact, we didn't look at things from a project perspective. We tried to look at things from a product perspective, meaning that we had, and I would pay and train people in each department. We'd have a single product owner. Before I left, that was what we were trying to do to get those people as product owners so that they understood the process and they had to be decision makers. They had to be people that were not saying, you know, hey, I'm going to send my admin assistant to go to this meeting. No, they had to be there. They had to be able to make the decision. And so that the, the agile team and the scrum team could actually put that into play. And we could do that whether we were implementing a COTS program or whether we were developing it in-house. Makes sense. And Benjamin is wondering, what kind of software tools did you use for your analysis and to show the structure and components of the city's IT and organization? Um, you broke up there a little bit. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, what kind of software tools did you use for your analysis and to show the structure and components of the city's IP, IT and organization? 
quite a few. Uh, in the beginning, I manually calculated. There's ways that you can do that by determining the number, the mean time to repair, the mean time of things being out, and adding all that stuff up and using some statistical methods to be able to determine downtime or access time. Um, later, we built a dashboard, and I could pull that up automatically. Everything was pull being pulled through our ITSM. Um, and I could look at any time I could pull my phone up sitting in the mayor's office or whatever, and they want to know the status of something, I could sit there and pull it up right there and say, well, it looks like this is on time. We've got this much money left in that budget and whatever else. Um, we used a lot of diagnostics and we used a lot of um, tools to be able to do that. It goes back to that value proposition and the other question that was asked. Uh, but the most part, we used um, Jira was one of our favorite tools that we used for that as well. It's pretty cool. I like that you can just pull it up on your phone too and be like, oh, let me just check in on that so quickly. No problem. <laughs> David is wondering, budgets are often siloed in government. Um, what were some of the creative ways you could access funding? So the first thing I did was I created what we call the technology replacement fund. And I, I kept a minimum of $500,000 in that fund. We, we got it up to a million at one point. But that was so that we had the money we needed at any time to replace anything. And I remember when I said that we had the average age of 15 years for all the technology. By the time I left, well, actually mid midstream when we were there, we got it to three years on average. Um, and we were constantly replacing things. So it was going from one cycle to the next. It was every year we were doing some department. So everybody only had three years worth of technology or three years worth of old technology. Um, that was primarily what we did with that. Oh, awesome. sorry. Let me add one more thing to that. With the technology replacement fund, we also had to go and again, it goes back to those relationships with those departments. You don't want to, we didn't do a chargeback model or anything like that, um, or tried not to at least. We understood that we had we would go in and buy licensings for folks and we would control that going all through the department. So everything was centralized. So whether it was software, whether it was licensing, whether it was hardware, it didn't matter. It all went through IT so that we could control it from start to finish. That's great. And I think this will be our last question for today. Um, Randall is wondering, how did you do with failure and in innovation? So failure is an interesting thing in government. Um a lot of governments don't like it because they don't want to be on the front page of the New York Times or the Chattanooga Times Free Press or whatever newspaper in their community saying, hey, the city of so-and-so spent $4 million and it was a failure and they didn't complete it. I'm not talking about things like that. Failure still is an option and you have to innovate to innovate. You cannot innovate without it. Um, none of the greats did. So you have to be willing to take a little bit of risk on but we still did our due diligence. It's not like we went out there and I told people, hey, no, 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 it's fine. Go fail. No problem. You know, spend millions of dollars. No, it wasn't like that at all. Everybody took responsibility. They did their due diligence. We looked at things over and over and over again. We analyzed it to the nth degree before we made decisions. We just moved rapidly and we got to a pace where we could move rapidly. So if we did fail, mostly in our own internal stuff and developments, for example, um, that way we, we could recover quickly and learn from it and go keep moving on. It happens. I like that mindset, though. Yep. All right. We'll wrap things up. Thank you, Brent, so much for sharing the success story of Chattanooga um, and for your entire presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. My pleasure. It's good to All be right. here. Bye. Thank you.